no matter what you're doing, no matter what degree you're pursuing, no matter what relationship you're in, no matter what you're doing with your life, from the day in, day out, moment by moment, all the way to your plans for the next 10, 20, 30 years of your life, do it in service of this one truth. Jesus Christ came, he was crucified, and he is saving you. College Podcast with your speaker, Pastor Taylor Gatt. I have watched just about every like survival show that there is, and uh, my favorite one is the show Alone. <coughs> has anybody ever seen that show? So that is, hands down, the best survival show that has ever been made, right? Uh, there's a lot of really dumb, gimmicky ones out there, like Naked and Afraid. That's stupid. That's a really stupid show. <laughs> but... Uh, alone is awesome. Alone, they literally drop these people in like a two square miles of the Arctic and they're like, last man standing wins a lot of money. And you just live on your own. You Like these people build like log cabins. It's awesome. Um, they are some of the foremost, you know, survival experts in the world. And they just drop them out there. Season one was interesting because like, I think they, no one knew what they were doing yet. Like what the show was going to be about. So there was a couple guys that got out there that weren't quite qualified and they like showed up season one and they were just like what are we doing <laughs> so that was interesting but uh so it's a really good show um one of the things that f- has fascinated me about that show though is the difference in some of the kinds of survivals they put out there so uh my favorite season was like two or three seasons ago they did a million dollar challenge first anybody who made it to 100 days got a million dollars and the guy who won he was totally like single-minded about survival. Everything he was doing for 100 days was designed to help him stay alive in the wilderness. Like, he never did anything other than improve his conditions, get food, get firewood. Like, that's all he was doing the whole time. They would clip to these other people in the survival, um, like, show. And these people, like, it just blows my mind. They're out there, like, starving. They're, like, trying to stay warm have food like they're they're living in the arctic winter is coming right and they are like one guy was like building a chair one guy was like he found some rocks that he made into like a little musical instrument and i was just like okay if i go camping and i have a cooler full of food and i'm out there for 100 days like and i'm like good to go maybe maybe some of these extracurricular activities but if i'm out there like starving I'm the guy who is just like every day, it's like, how am I going to eat today? Like, what? how am I going to get more food? And I don't understand, like, not just hunting, like, around the clock. Like, if there's daylight, I'm hunting. Like, that's what we're doing, right? But they they wouldn't do that. They would they would get, like, distracted. And they all lost. The one guy made it. Uh, one girl almost made it. Um, she caught a ton of fish. But she did the same thing. She was single-minded. All she was doing every day was trying to catch fish. That's it. And between the two of them, it was the people who stayed focused and just had one thought, one thing they were trying to accomplish. They did the best. They made it the furthest. Everyone who just like kind of went out there to just have a good old time, it's like they didn't understand the severity of their situation. They didn't understand like the gravity of how much they needed to do to survive in this setting. And they weren't single-minded about it. Right. So the thing is, we often forget this because we live in America, but life is a is a survival game right now. You don't wake up in the morning and think, I'm not sure I'm going to eat today. Like you don't think that. But the reality is, I'm not talking just about your physical survival. The question is, how are you going to survive in existence? Like, how are you going to survive your final moments, right? Because the question really is like, if if every morning you get up and it's just kind of the automation of your life until the day you die and you just, whatever happens after that, whatever, like that's not, it's not a great plan. It's not a great prospect. It honestly is a little bit scary to me because it's like, why, why get up every morning? Or why not change the way that I'm living my life? I'm certainly not going to be in church all the time. Like this seems like a waste of time if it's just make the best of what you've got until you die. 
So my question is, how am I going to survive in existence? How am I going to make it, right? When I die, am I going to wake up the next second and be somewhere else? Am I going to survive that, right? Um, you've probably heard the joke like, life has a 100% fatality rate. Right. Like, like we're, we're all going to die. So the question is like, how do we, how do we focus on what's important? Do we understand the gravity of our situation? Again, because we live in America, oftentimes we miss the gravity of our situation because I think most of the time we wake up wondering how we're going to be entertained. Like, how am I going to be like gratified today in, in, in the entertainment saturated world I live in? But we're not, we're missing the point, which is like, what's actually important and how am I going to live? And, and how am I going to keep living? And not just keep living physically, right? And so the question is, are you single-minded? And then the, the next question, the next piece of that is, whose mind are you single-minded with? Are you single-minded with the mind of the world, with what the world thinks is important? Or are you single-minded with the mind of Christ? Are you connected to the way that Jesus views the world around us and are you living according to the way that he sees life, right? Are you single-minded? Do you know what you're putting your hope in, right? Because whatever you are focusing on, even if that's entertainment, that's what your hope is in. That's the thing you think is, is going to fulfill you and sustain you. That's what you think is going to make it. I mean, that's why, that's why we eat every day, right? We got a lot of hope put in food, naturally. Because we know that if we don't go, if we don't eat, something bad's going to happen. Well, the question is, do you understand what's going to happen if you don't eat and feed your soul in a spiritual sense? How do we know what our hope is in? And how do we know that what our hope is in is in the right thing? How do we know that we're actually focusing on the right thing? Now, we're in a series um, in 1 Corinthians. I'm calling it Church Fails. I've called it church fails because if you've ever read Corinthians, it's just basically a giant uh, to don't do list, right? It's just this giant list of complaints that Paul is responding to in the church in Corinthians, and he's going, stop that, stop this, don't do this, right? Now, we're only in the second chapter, and because we're only in the second chapter, he hasn't necessarily gotten to some of the specifics of all the things he doesn't want them to do, but he is telling them, uh, he is telling them, what to focus on. If we focus on the right thing, if we have the right foundation, then everything that we come off of after that, the way we behave, it will be the correct behavior, right? Like, I don't want, I don't ever want to stand up here and tell you guys, this is how you should be behaving in your life. What I want to tell you is, this is what the gospel is. And if you truly understand the gospel, you will naturally behave a certain way. Right, that's the point, and that's what Paul's doing. So Paul, in the early parts of 1 Corinthians, is saying, this is the gospel. This is why it affects our lives. This is how we should live because of the gospel. So Paul, last week he said, uh, or two weeks ago, last time we had Sunday school, he said that the, uh, he said that the power of God is something the world views as foolishness. Right, so if you remember that lesson, he said, the most foolish thing God ever did, letting himself be killed, right? It was the most powerful act in all of creation, in all of human history, right? The, the most unwise, the silliest, most foolish thing God ever did was the only thing that can save us, right? So God's most foolish or most, uh, most weak moment was actually more powerful than anything we could ever muster. That's what we saw in the end of chapter one. So then this week, as we get into chapter two, He's going to say, some people know this power. Some people have experienced this power, have been saved by God's most foolish or most weak moment, and others are completely distracted. They're distracted by the world around them. They don't know what to pay attention to. So the question is, how do we know what we know? Are we trying to know the world, or are we trying to know God? What is the most important thing in life? That, that really is the question. If you understand the most important thing in life, then everything you do will be in effort to that end. You'll be moving towards that most important thing. It will allow you to stay focused when all the rest of the world is trying to distract you. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. 
And when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come as someone superior in speaking ability or wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I also was with you in weakness and fear and in great trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in uh, persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration. In, the, in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of mankind, but on the power of God. Okay, so the first thing he says is, he says, I didn't come to you with superior or persuasive speech or wisdom, right? I didn't come to you making these fancy arguments. Now, you have to understand the culture that he's in that he's talking about right now, right? This is not, I've heard somebody say that this is evidence that we shouldn't uh, try to be like, good at presenting the gospel or good at uh, preaching or things like this, right? That's not what he's saying. He is talking to a church that is uh, in a very Hellenistic society. This is a very Greek foundational uh, world. I mean, Rome is right is the, the empire of the time. They rule the known world. And Hellenistic, the Hellenistic way of life has spread everywhere. Now, what that means is the Greeks were big on philosophy and rhetoric and speech and being persuasive, making good arguments. So it was a common thing to gain followers in this time period by making very impressive rhetorical arguments, right? What they did is that they would get together in in their, in their uh, communal areas, in their societies, and they would let people basically stand up and present uh, an explanation of life, a philosophy, and, a, and they would they would really follow somebody if they were the most persuasive and accomplished speaker. The thing is, we do that, like, now, right? We watch our famous people, our celebrities, and we tend to follow people who, who are very silver-tongued, the people who can explain the best of why their way of life, even sometimes things that are completely logically uh, in shambles, but as long as you can make it sound good, people will flock to you. Right? And so he says, I didn't come to you in the Greek way. I didn't come to you just to be persuasive and make my rhetorical argument and, and use all these fancy ways of bringing you in. I came to you, and instead, I proclaimed God's testimony. What is God's testimony? God's testimony is the Bible, right? And what is the Bible? I, I, I think this is something I can't, I can't say enough. I grew up in the church, and I didn't realize this. The entire Bible is the gospel. It is about the gospel from cover to cover. There's nothing else in here. That's what it is, right? And I think that Pete, we miss this a lot of times. We think like, I mean, you, you know, you don't have to go very far to ask somebody like, what's the gospel? And they're like, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's like, okay, sort of, not really. The point is that we call those the gospels because those crystallize the message. We see the gospels lived out in Jesus Christ. That is the good news, right? But the good news has been written from end to end. We just spent 12, 13, 14 weeks in Genesis. And if you remember, back when we started in Genesis chapter 1, we literally started with, look at how the gospel is literally being told from the first moments of creation. It's all over this book. This is God's testimony about himself and his plan to save you. That's what this is cover to cover. And so what Paul is saying is he said, I didn't come to you with a bunch of persuasive rhetorical speech and technique. I came to you and I presented just merely God's testimony, what God is saying about himself and about what he's doing to save you. And he said, I determined to know one thing, Christ crucified. Right now, I need you to understand this. He's not saying, I literally didn't know anything else. I, like, you ask me a question, I'm like, I don't know, but Jesus was crucified, right? That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, this was my sole ambition. This was the only thing that mattered, the only thing that cared about. I lived that out. I put that on display for you, that this is the only thing that matters, right? He said, I didn't get distracted. I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't have ambitions over here to do this or ambitions over here to do that. I wasn't trying to gain a following for Paul or, or be the most impressive speech, uh, speaker, I was trying to make known God's testimony about himself and that Jesus Christ is the Savior who was crucified for you, right? That was the only thing. I want you to understand, this, this verse, determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, that should be 
the focus of all of our lives. That verse is Paul saying, there is only one thing that matters. You want to get out of life alive? That verse is the only thing that you need to know. Now, we learn, we, we experience life because God uses all aspects of creation to, to share his testimony, right? Like, I'm not telling you, don't go do anything else ever. I'm saying, do everything else in service of this one true thing. No matter what you're doing, no matter what degree you're pursuing, no matter what relationship you're in, no matter what you're doing with your life, from the day in, day out, moment by moment, all the way to your plans for the next 10, 20, 30 years of your life, newsflash, they're not going to come true like you think they are. (laughs) But whatever you're doing, do it in service of this one truth. Jesus Christ came, he was crucified, and he is saving you. And he's saving all of us. That is the only thing Paul says he knew. In verse 3, he says that he lived alongside them in in weakness, right? This is basically the exact opposite of what he's saying at the beginning. He's saying, I didn't come to you to be the strongest leader, the most powerful person, the most persuasive. I came to you and I lived in the day in, day out of life when everything sucked, when everything was bad, when it was rough. See, this is the thing. The Christian life isn't glamorous. It's, we're not, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we're not like in power anymore, really anywhere in the world. The point is not that we are going to rule and dominate and be awesome all the time. The point is that while everyone else is focused on that, being entertained, being powerful, being famous, whatever, we are going to be picking each other up out of the mud and the muck and the dirt of life and saying, I'm right here. I'm with you. Let's keep going. That's what Christianity is. I once heard somebody say that Christianity is a crutch for the the weak and the broken of the world. And I was like, yes! (laughs) Like, yes, that is literally the point. Like, that's not a slander or a slur. Yes, that is what's going on. The difference is we're all weak and we're all broken. The question is, do you realize it? Like, everyone needs this same crutch. The question is, have you accepted that? Have you humbled yourself to the point where you go, I need that crutch. I need that thing. Or I'm in a lot of trouble. You know, the Gospels are filled with Jesus saying, I didn't come for all the people who got it all together. I came for the people who don't have it all together. I came for the sinners and the broken and the weak. He says, I didn't come to you in the Greek way. I came to you and you saw the demonstration of the Spirit and power. Okay, this is interesting. Demonstration of the Spirit. I want to point out something to you. I can be as good a preacher as I want to be. But do you know what actually convinces you that what I'm saying on a given Sunday and a given sermon is true? It's that when when I let the Holy Spirit spend the week teaching me a passage, and then I get up here and I say, guys, look at that verse. You see how that's true? The demonstration of the Spirit is that in your own souls, as you communicate with the Spirit, you know it's true because you are talking with God about it. You're not, you're not just believing what I say. You're not being convinced because I'm just so talented at convincing you. You are actually having a demonstration of the Spirit in your spirit. See, here's the thing. If you come to church and the pastor either A, doesn't use this book, in that case, just leave, or B, says something and you don't, you don't feel a way about it at all. The Spirit is not teaching you whether or not the things being said are true, you have to ask yourself, do you have the Spirit? Are you communing with God who is your teacher, right? I can't remember what book I'm I'm blanking, but there's a book where uh, the author says, you don't need a teacher. You have the Spirit. Well, that doesn't mean we don't like now we'll just, you know, we'll just all stare at this board and just figure it out on our own, right? That's not what it means. It means that I'm not the one convincing you this is true. I'm literally just presenting what the Holy Spirit has told me. And in your own spirit, the Holy Spirit is going, do you see it? Do you see what I'm trying to tell you? Do you see what I'm talking about? That demonstration of the Spirit is how you know that this is true, right? That same thing happens when you just have your quiet time. And again, if it doesn't, we need to talk about whether or not you actually have the Spirit. We need to talk about if you actually are communing with, with God so that He can teach you these things, right? And then He says, He says, 
I came to you with the demonstration of the Spirit and power. Okay, what does that mean? Well, the, what is the power of God? We've established this. There is the power of God is always a reference to the gospel, right? At least in the New Testament. It's always a reference to the gospel. What it means is, what is the power of God? Like, of course God has power. Of course God can do whatever he wants to do. What is God's power? It's that God has the power to save you. I, I want to point this out to you because I, I think that we, again, we grew up in the Bible Belt. We go to church all the time. It's kind of like we numb out to these things. But let's just walk through a couple of the absolutely absurd, impossible things that had to happen for you to be saved, right? If you think it's not impossible for you to be saved, it's actually impossible, okay? L let's look at it. Impossibly, a virgin had to give birth to a baby without a human father, conceived by the Holy Spirit. That baby had to grow up sinless, became a carpenter, claiming to be God, who then died, wait for it, and then came back to life, okay? Nothing about that makes any sense. That is the most impossible string of events that you could ever thought up. That's why nobody thought it up. That's why literally the Old Testament is like born of a virgin. And people are like, I wonder what that means. And then it literally happened like just like that. Like it's impossible. It doesn't make any sense. So I need you guys to understand that it should be impossible for you to go to heaven, for you to ever be with God. The power of God is that he did the most impossible thing. It is actually more impossible for you to go to heaven than it is for creation to happen at all. It took less for God to create the whole world and all, and all the universe and everything in it than it does for him to save you. And he still did that thing. That's how powerful he is. So that's what he's saying. He's saying, I didn't come to you with persuasive words. I didn't come to you to convince you this is true. I came to you and I said, is the spirit telling you what I'm saying is true? Look at the gospel. That's what I came to you with. And you know it's true because you have the Spirit who's telling you this th these things, right? He says, I did all this so that your faith is not resting on what Taylor says, what Paul says, what any preacher says. Your faith is not resting on what your preacher tells you, right? That's what cults do. A cult is... I am the representative of God and I have a special revelation and now I'm going to give it to you. No, I'm coming to you and I'm telling you, hey, this is what God's spirit told me. And because I believe it's true, I'm going to present it to you. And then God's spirit's going to confirm that in you. And I want your faith to rest on what the spirit confirms in you about God's power, not just because I said it so convincingly. Right. So he says, I did this so that you could rest on the actual gospel. There are people all over our country whose faith is in their leader. Not, not in, listen, I'm not the way. I'm pointing you to the way. But Jesus doesn't say, I'm bringing you to the way. Jesus says, I am the way. You see, you see the difference, right? See, again, a cult leader will say, I'm the way also to Jesus, right? Or in some cases, right? But the difference is, I'm not the way. I'm just pointing you to the way. Your faith has to rest on the actual gospel. Listen, I want you guys to think about this this week. Stop trying to convince your friends to get saved. I mean, really. And, and, and don't mishear me. This does not mean don't answer any questions. If your friends have questions, answer their questions, right? But there is a difference between somebody who has a spirit that wants to know, that is asking a legitimate question, and somebody playing stump the chump, right? Somebody who's just trying to trip you up, be like, well, if the Bible's so true, what is... Listen, that, that mentality, I'm out immediately, right? That, the Bible calls that throwing your pearls before swine, right? So what I want you to see is don't argue with people. Don't try to persuade them. Just present the gospel, Ask them to come to the church. Here's the reality. Most of the reason that we're trying to convince people to get saved is because we think it's our job to save them. And the other reality is some of you are trying to convince your friends because you're still trying to convince yourself, right? It's a lacking somewhere in your faith that's unfolding in how you're presenting the gospel to your friends. 
but it's a lacking in your faith that's actually causing you to be afraid to have that conversation with your friends. Even ask them church, listen, not everyone in here is always going to be at the same level of ability to present the gospel. If you ever presented the gospel, the first time you do it, it comes out all kinds of jumble. <laughs> I mean, you're just like, it, there's a baby, and then he grew up, and but creation happened so that Jesus could save us, and it's like, whoa, what are we talking about, right? Okay, that's fine. Maybe you're not, maybe you need practice. Maybe you need reps. First of all, I would tell you, get those reps on your brother and sister Christ. They need to hear the gospel too, okay? But, but secondly, just invite them to church. Quit trying to convince your friends of, that the gospel is true. Convince your friends that God exists and just invite them to church and let us as a team, as a group, all try to, to, to share the gospel with them. Listen, there are some people in this room who they will share the gospel with a, like a, a piece of broken wood on the ground. Like they like it doesn't matter. They will just it's just leaking out of them. OK, <laughs> so. So if you are having trouble sharing the gospel, bring your friends here and we will do it as a group. It's not like God is going to be in heaven like, well, so-and-so gets credit for that one because you, you, all you did was invite him to church. No, it's all of us together bringing that person in. But you have to get over the fear in your own brain that you don't know an answer. You, don't, you haven't convinced yourself this is true to the point where you can now tell someone else. Just go share power with your friends. And here's the thing. The Spirit is working in their soul. It's working in their spirit. He's trying to save them. So all you have to do is present the power of God's truth and let the Holy Spirit do the saving. I wish that I could actually like preach so hard you had to be saved. <laughs> like, that would be so cool, right? It's not possible. Okay, I can't do it. I, I literally can't do it. I, I think I told, I don't know if I've told this from up here, but a couple weeks back, I got an opportunity to go preach to a conference in Oklahoma City of, of youth students. Uh, it was a last second thing. Um, the person, who spoke, AJ was supposed to go and he had a family emergency. And so I all of a sudden found myself, I woke up that Wednesday, normal day. And like three hours later, I was driving to Oklahoma City. Um, I get there. And I present the gospel, like that's all, it, was just, it wasn't like, I didn't preach a sermon, I basically got up and did a gospel presentation to a youth conference with 1,500 kids, okay? Let me tell you something. I got up there and I felt totally helpless and useless because I realized like, I can't convince these kids to know Jesus. I can't preach them into heaven, okay? I didn't have the best sermon. I mean, I literally found out that morning. It's not like I had six weeks of prep where I had this like just amazing gospel presentation, I just went and presented them the power of God to save them. And you know what happened? People got up, came to the front, met with their youth leaders, and got saved. Okay? I didn't do that. I didn't preach those people into heaven. I didn't convince them to come forward. I just said, this is the gospel. And then the Holy Spirit in them moved them forward, and they made decisions that changed their eternity. Like, if I had got up there and it was all on me, not a single kid would have moved. Stop trying to be the person that saves people. Just present them the opportunity. Be the person that says, here's the gospel. Or, hey, come to church and hear the gospel, right? It can be that simple. There's only one way to know salvation. It is through the Holy Spirit. It is through Him working in you to save you. That is the only way to know God. <coughs> Excuse me. You ever had somebody steal like a joke from you? Or, like a phrase? What, like, whenever you hear them say it, there's always like, where'd you hear that? <laughs> how, how, where'd you get that joke? Right? It's like, it's like, excuse me, that was for me, right? And honestly, let's be real, like you probably stole it. But but the, the thing is there's always like this desire to take credit, right? Like you always kind of want to be like you want them to go like, haha, here's this funny joke, oh everybody laughed. That was totally them. They like like that's not how that works, but that's what you want, right? You want them to like give you credit. Here's the thing. You are not the originator of the gospel. 
right? When you present the gospel, God's like, hey, where'd you hear that? How do you know that? Right? He wants you to point people to the Holy Spirit. He wants to put you to point people to the only way they can know the truth of the gospel, right? God wants credit for what he has done, right? Because you're not the one that saves people. How do you know? And here's the thing. When you present the gospel, that should be a natural question for somebody you're presenting the gospel to. If you present the gospel, somebody should look at you and go, how do you know this is true? How do you know? And the answer is not, well, makes sense. Or, well, I, I studied it. No, the answer is I know because the Holy Spirit lives inside of me and tells me it's true, confirms it to me. That doesn't make any sense to a non-believer, and that's okay. Because the Holy Spirit is working in them to get them to that place. Look at verse 6. Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature. I'm sorry. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in the mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which, uh, um, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the human heart, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Why does our society tear down statues? Our society tears down statues because the morality that's in vogue today tells us that the people of the past had it wrong. They were messed up. Here's the, here's the really stupid part about that. We might as well stop putting up statues. Because if anybody now deserves a statue, give it about 40, 100 years, we're going to be tearing that statue down because they got it wrong. Right? The thing about the rulers of our day, about the celebrity influencers of our time, is that their morality is, is whatever, whatever's in right now, whatever's popular right now. It's not based off of what God set into place before creation. Right? God is the standard, and God existed before time, before creation, and what he is is unchanging through all of human history. He set the standard from the very beginning, from before the very beginning. God's foolishness is wisdom to those who are mature in Christ, to those who are saved. See, because when you have the Spirit, He confirms in you that God's most foolish moment was also God's most brilliant, most powerful moment. It was actually God's most brilliant, most powerful moment. It was the thing that saves you. He calls it a mystery that was predestined. See, before God started any of this, he established how he was going to save us. He already knew. He already had the plan. It's not like Adam and Eve fell into sin and God was like, oh no, I got to get this figured out now. We got to backtrack. No, God never panicked. He always knew what he was going to do to redeem humans. Now that, why did he call it a mystery? Because it wasn't revealed until Jesus came. See, because the whole Old Testament is pointing to the gospel. It's pointing to Jesus. But the whole time, people were like, I, I don't get it. How's this going to work? How's this going to actually pan out? Right? And then they missed it. They missed it hardcore when he actually got here because they were like, well, clearly the gospel is that this Messiah person is going to come and conquer Rome. Listen, believe it or not, like the worries of your life are small in comparison to what salvation is about. See, they were concerned with the worries of their day, the moment right in front of their face, and God was like, I'm up to way bigger stuff than beating Rome. Rome is temporary. I mean, anybody know a Roman citizen? They're gone, okay? But God was busy saving us. He was unfolding his salvation plan. He wasn't worried about Rome. He was focused on the big thing, the current rulers of that age, they killed Jesus because they didn't understand. And here's the thing. Um, we wouldn't do that because we have the Holy Spirit. But let's like, like if Jesus was coming for the first time now, we would kill him. We would do the same exact thing because we would have a different reason why he didn't match what we thought the Messiah should be doing. It'd be the same problem. 
we're not better than them, right? The only reason I say like we wouldn't is because we already have the Holy Spirit. Like, thank goodness. But if we didn't have the Holy Spirit, we would make the exact same decision. Look at verse 10. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among people knows the thoughts of a person except the Spirit of the person that is in him? So also the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Okay, who knows your innermost workings more than your own spirit. That's it. You, you're the only person. I mean, you can tell people all day. You can sit down and stare into somebody's eyes and like just tell them who you are all day long. They are still never going to know you to the extent that you know you, right? Even to the extent that you know when you're full of it. Like, you know when you're putting on a front and telling somebody, oh, well, this is who I am, and you're like, I wish that's who I was, right? Or you're shielding some fact. Honestly, we're all too scared to tell people who we really are half the time, right? The reality is that only your spirit delves into you enough to really know who you are. Now, think about this. This is one of the coolest verses. I don't think I've ever seen this verse until I study this passage. So also the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. Oh, I'm sorry, before that. It's where it says, even the depths of God, even the depths of God, the Holy Spirit is delving into the infinite depths of who God is. That is insane. But now, let's take it a step further. The Spirit delving into the infinite depths of who God is, you get to share that Spirit. What if you actually, like, your spirit is the only entity that knows you. What if somebody also had your spirit in them and could actually know you that way because your spirit was in them going, yeah, this is who that is. Okay, God's spirit in him who knows him infinitely in a way that you can't even imagine is in you telling you who he is. That's nuts. You get you get to share in God's spirit, in a way where his spirit is actively saying, this is who I am, this is who I am, this is what I think, this is what I feel. Now you get to feel, like you can you can feel alongside of somebody, you can share in something with somebody, but you're not actually like partaking in their spirit when they're going through something. But when you have the Holy Spirit, you get to feel what God feels. Actually like when he feels it, when God is sad about something, you can feel that same sadness. That is that is mind-blowing, right? Again, part of the Christian life is just figuring out how to want what God wants when he wants it, right? Like, that, I always point to that phrase, the uh, faith of a mustard seed will move mountains. You know what that really is talking about? If your faith is in line with what God wants to do, you're seeing, you're looking at the mountains God's already busy moving, right? You're, you're participating in what he's about when he's about it. That is the whole point of sharing in that spirit, right? Nine times out of 10, the reason you missed that God's moving mountains is because you're not looking for it. You're not up to the same thing God's up to. But if you're about what God's doing, nothing is getting in God's way. So if you're on the same mission that God's on and there's a mountain in the way, it's like, oh, well, I don't know how it's going to work, but I know that mountain's not going to stop God. And now you're looking at it and it gets out of your way. That's the whole point. Are you sharing in this same spirit? And this same spirit is actively telling you what? About salvation. But the fact that God is saving you, is doing the impossible, is moving crazy mountains just so you could be in heaven. That's the whole point. Look at verse 13. We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. This is what I'm talking about. Stop just trying to convince your friends to get saved, to agree with you, to think what you think. Share with them spiritual thoughts and spiritual words about the true power of God and let Him work it out. Let Him solve what's going on in their soul. Let Him change their hearts, their inner workings. Here's the thing. They're not going to share in your spirit. They're going to share in the Holy Spirit. Well, the, the cool part is, as soon as they share in the Holy Spirit, 
they are going to share a spirit with you because you also are sharing in that Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever <clears throat> noticed this. It's something I've been noticing a lot over the last couple of years. In, in, it's really a cool phenomenon. One is non-Christians telling Christians something's different about you. Have you ever seen that? Because they, they, you, we're sharing in something. We're communing in something inside of us that they don't have, they don't participate in. And when that happens, they're like, I don't know, something's weird about you. We went to Barnabas two years ago, and uh, if any of you met uh, uh, Jackson over, yeah, over this, over the reach retreat, he got saved two years ago at Barnabas, and he told us something was different. I was in a room with a bunch of evergreen people, and you guys all had something that I didn't have. He could sense the Holy Spirit inside of us, and he knew he didn't have it. That is nuts. I also went to Brazil earlier this year, and I met people that I have no business being close to. We don't share the same language. We don't share the same culture. We don't, we don't know each other. I met them for the first time far away from my home and instantly felt a connection with them like I loved them dearly. Why? Because we were sharing in the same spirit. Something about who we were on the inside connected in a way that humans can't do outside of being connected with the Holy Spirit, being connected with God. See, the beautiful thing is that's actually the that was the design from the beginning. We were all supposed to share in God's Spirit and with each other and have this permanent connection in society with other humans and with God. That was the whole point. One big group hug. And we lost it. And Christianity is offering you to get back into that connection with God and with other people through His Spirit. When your friend asks you, how do you know? Tell them because God told you so. Quit trying to walk them through the logic of it and just tell them because I, because I have the Spirit of God in me. And He talks to me and He walks with me and He teaches me. Is this foreign to you? Is, so, is everything I'm saying, does it make no sense? Because if it does, I want you so badly to take notice of that. If none of this makes sense to you, you need to have a conversation with somebody about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to walk in this faith. You might be missing something. Do you have the mind of Christ or do you have the mind of the world? There is a popular, like, kind of trope in uh, television about aliens. There's like the, the hive mind like type idea, right? So it's like the aliens that are like, they're like gathering more and more people to be in their hive mind. It's just like, and everyone just shares this one brain, right? Okay. Uh, that's also another feature of cults, right? Because cults are saying that like this leader, he is the mind, he is the brain. He will tell you what to think. He'll tell you what to do, okay? That is not what Christianity is. Okay, Christianity is not the hive mind. Christianity is that I'm not telling you what to think. Christianity is that I'm telling you this is how God feels about something and he confirms that in you and you, you see how good it is. You see how much you want that. See, the, the dangerous thing that happens in cults is, is that they go, they, they, a, lot of, a lot of cults, especially in America, they will, talk, they will talk about the Bible up to a certain point, and then they'll go, and here's the extra stuff that only I know, right? That's as soon as they, as soon as they like close this, and they're like, now let's talk about what God told me, you are in a bad place, right? Don't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> but the point is, the Holy Spirit is the way that you know these things. It is the way that you are, that it's confirmed in you. When your pastor says, when any of your pastors say, wow, look, look at what this verse says and how it's what God is telling us here. The Holy Spirit should be working in you to confirm that, right? That is what we're telling people when we turn around and share the gospel. We're telling them something that then the Holy Spirit goes into them and says, you know this is true. Lay down your life and follow me because this is the truth. He's the one doing the convincing. He's the one shaping their hearts to be convinced by what you're telling them. Look at verse 14. But a natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. But the one who is spiritual discerns all things, yet he himself is discerned by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? 
but we have the mind of Christ. This foolishness of God, the only way we can learn it is by faith. Honestly, don't I, I, I don't like like reusing analogies, but man, if you guys have not seen the uh, the Last Crusade, Indian Jones' Last Crusade, just for this one scene that I'm going to keep bringing up, you should go watch it, right? Because it is literally the best illustration of faith that I've ever seen, right? He's got the bridge, or he's got the the gap right in front of him. He's got to jump. He's told leap of faith, and he's like, ah, uh, this this doesn't make any sense. There's no way anybody can make this this leap. And he steps out and he finds that there's something there. And as he walks and his perspective changes, he sees that there's a rock bridge that blends into the other side. Right? But he couldn't see it until he was already, until he already made the faith walk part of it. Right? It didn't make sense. It was foolishness. Right? When he's over here and he can't see it, like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. That's the point of Christianity. It doesn't make sense looking at it from this perspective. But once you get out here on the bridge and you're walking and then you can see it, you're like, oh my goodness. It makes perfect sense. Of course there was something here. Of course there was a way to get across. Right? But he has to walk by faith before he can see it. That's the point. This is a foolishness that is learned by faith. This is why, have you ever noticed like, it's really hard. You can see God provide for you a thousand times, and it's really hard to think God will provide for you the next time, right? Why is that? Because it's like saying, oh, you know how crazy supernatural things that should be impossible happened before? They'll happen again, right? Like, it, that doesn't ever make sense. I honestly, we read the Old Testament and we look at the, the Israelites and we're like, I don't get it. How could they walk across the Red Sea and then immediately think God's going to ban them? Actually, it makes perfect sense. Because if you think, Man, that was crazy and should never happen. You don't turn around and be like, I bet God rains bread from heaven now. Like that, <laughs> it doesn't make sense, right? So the thing is, it's not, it actually doesn't make sense to think that miracles will continue to occur. It's foolishness. It is continually you having to step out on faith, right? You don't step out on faith because you think for sure this supernatural thing will happen. You step out on faith because you say, for sure, God will not stop coming through. No idea how that's going to happen. But it's not going to stop. God will come through. If, if Just go read, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The disciples were, just had their heads on backwards the whole time. They're running around like crazy people, watching God perform miracles. I mean, like, the most mind-blowing thing in the Gospels for me is like, watching the feeding of the 5,000 and then being unsure about the feeding of the 4,000. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. They were like, you know how God fed all those people before? What are we going to do this time? Like, yeah. like what? <laughs> right? But but again, it, it didn't make sense the first time. Like, God made food come out of just, like, nowhere. It, they couldn't have expected it going forward. The key was that they were learning to walk in faith. They were sharing the mind of Christ Right? And this is, in a sense, it's an individual walk. Right, You share the mind of Christ, but you can't actually experience your friend's faith. Right, You can relate to your friend's faith, but you don't have your friend's faith. They have their faith, you have your faith, and, and you, can, you can kind of like compare, but it's an individual walk. That's why he says, discerned by no one. He says, we look around and we make judgments from our spirit, but no one actually is going through what I'm going through. I'm the only person going through what I'm going through. Now, so many people are going through stuff I'm similar, like similar to me, right? That's that's the key. That's why we talk about our troubles and our trials because we find out, oh wow, you're going through that same thing. And oftentimes when people are going through the same thing, what God told them helps us, right? That's the whole point. But they're still not going through what you're going through. They're going through their own version of the same thing. It's it, it that's the faith walk. It's you and the mind of Christ. It's you and the Holy Spirit walking through this together and then sharing it with your brothers and sisters. Resting is an act, is acting out what you believe despite what you can see. See, a lot of times we say we believe stuff, but we won't act on it. If you believe something, you will act on it even when it doesn't make any sense. That is what, that's the point. That's what faith is. Are you resting in Christ and in his work? Or are you missing the point? 
Are you distracted? Are you trying to know other accomplishments, other achievements? Do you wake up in the morning thinking, how do I be entertained today? How do I accomplish my goals and dreams for life? Or do you wake up and say, how do I make everything in my life serve the truth of Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Are you resting in Christ in your faith? Are you resting in Christ in your major major decisions in your life? Are you submitting those things to Him? Are you resting in, in God, in Christ, in your dating lives? Are you resting in Christ in anything? Like, like sometimes I ask people this question, what about your life points to faith at all? Like, do you just like, like you show up to church and like you own a Bible and you're just like, yeah, literally nothing else I do resembles Christ or shows that I have the Holy Spirit, but like I'm clearly saved. I, I live in South Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I go to church on Sundays. Yeah, like there are people that do that because it's social. My question for you is what about your life actually resembles that you believe this? That you're actually acting it out and living on it? This week, take a good look at yourself and how you are living this out. And stop letting your personal insecurities and your faith prevent you from presenting the power of the gospel to your friends. Hey guys, this is Philip Jackson, pastor of Young Adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen Church in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. The mission of Reach Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that's defined by real transformation and the sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.